Um, you probably wonder what, you know, why are we the, the people who are here? So um, we have this common bond in all, that all of us came together to create the Fair Family Favorites Cookbook, which was a celebration of the 100th anniversary of the fair. But it's also, we um, were thankful to the, um, to the county commissioners and the whole um, county of route because we got um, museum and heritage fund board uh, monies to help us create this book and to celebrate the history of route county so 100 years of great recipes and all that kind of thing here and so this is what brings all of us together to um, be a part of um, presenting to you guys here at the museum and being a part of that so i'll just introduce my crew real quickly um, we've got jackie i'm um, sherry grimaldi and she's got lots of generations of um, a family history here so she's a really important piece we we have Linda Long, who is in the same position, and she's got lots of generations of history here and has um, a love of food as well. We have Mary Kay Shaneman, and then we also have Karen Massey, and Karen's um, claim to fame is that she's with the Colorado State University Extension here in Rock County. So, And I'm Nancy Monclo. Um, so we're going to turn it over to Karen to start the program. Okay. So, yay. Okay. Oh, and just so you know, we do have a few samplings here. We do expect them to be eaten, so they're not just for show. <laughs> um, First of all, I, I need to introduce myself as the Family and Consumer Science Extension Agent here in Route County. Um, I told Nancy I would give the, the first kind of 10 minutes of talk, but I really got into this and had so much fun. By the time I contacted CSU and they started digitizing some of the early records of Extension in Route County, I really had no idea what to tell you because it's all so interesting. But the most important thing is that while I am the director of the office and the family consumer science agent, I um, used to, my position used to be called the home economist, but it's also the home demonstration agent. And um, as my boss back in the room, back in the back of the room, CJ Bunklow, <laughs> reminded me that early on, the, um, the home demonstration agent was really just the assistant county agent <laughs> so, we, so it used to be the assistant but um but are you all familiar with the role of home demonstration clubs and home demonstration agents in rural okay so this is good um well let me go back and say that 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 long before extension was in this valley the only way it could really be settled is for people to be able to feed themselves and, uh, and being able to travel with food uh, in the middle of our very cold winters, look outside and see what they were dealing with, they would not have been able to settle this valley successfully in any large amount without figuring out how to preserve food. So we're gonna talk a little bit about canning. Probably the earliest thing was um, dehydration and Mary Kay is gonna talk about that. Um, but it was all about figuring out how to feed people in a rural setting when they had no access to refrigeration or, or produce in, in the winter. So that is it's core to the, to the development of this valley. But as people started moving into the, the area, um, where extension really kind of comes into play with food preservation is first of all, we um, started to exist with the, with the Smith Lever Act in 1914. So the creation of the extension service was 1914, um, so we just celebrated our 100th anniversary. Here in Route County, thank you very much, we were not, um, we didn't really have a strong presence in, until closer to the 1930s. Now what else was happening in the 1930s? Well, the, the Depression. And, um, and what happened is people were having a hard time making ends meet. And the extension service was core to helping them survive that time. At that same time, they did a number of studies um, asking farm women what they needed. And what they found, and I'm going to just kind of look at my notes here, what they found is that when they surveyed women in rural United States, they were lonely, they were isolated, they needed some kind of a social and educational opportunity. And so, uh, and I'm gonna show you some pictures back in that time, and, and I would say they look pretty grumpy. And so, um, so, so the creation of, of um, home demonstration agents really was to support home demonstration clubs. 
So throughout the valley in uh, Moffat and Rowe County and across the state, they started forming these small groups of women that would meet monthly. And they really wanted to gain more skills. So they would bring somebody from campus. At the time, it was Colorado State College. Was it Colorado A&M at that point? Anyhow, it was our <laughs> land grant university that is now Colorado State University. And they would send, they would teach the skills to the home demonstration agent. The home demonstration agent, then her job was to travel to all of these clubs and teach them skills. So as I go back and I look at some of the really cool historic documents, now I brought some of the ones that are still in our office go back to 1956, but the ones prior to this have been given to the library in um, Fort Collins at, on campus. And, um, and they did a rush job and digitized some of them. And some of the things, and I'll just look at those, some of the things I discovered, first of all, from a report that was done in 1929. Now, at this point, there wasn't a home demonstration agent here in, in Route County. There was an agent that covered both Route and Moffat County. And this is what she said. A lack of information concerning normal diets and the lack of water, short growing season, and other problems confronting families which have homesteaded in Northwest Colorado have resulted in malnutrition in many homes. Currently, 61% of 4-H club members are underweight. Um, so, as a response to that, they developed these clubs. In the first year of developing the clubs, there was one in Troll, Twin, Twin Mesa, uh, Mesa maybe, Clark, Lador, Great Divide. Those were the initial clubs. And I, my guess is many of those were over in the Moffat County area. Okay, so I'm hearing, yeah. Um, then they also started 4-H clubs with young girls. And these were um, organized around meal preparation. With the primary effort uh, to overcome food dislikes and use of more vegetables, milk, and whole grain products. That was emphasized. This is 1929. As a dietitian, I hear people say to me all the time, you nutrition types keep changing your mind. Well, let me tell you, those recommendations aren't any different than what I tell people now. And I find that hilarious. So, um, so the home demonstration agent did a number of, of workshops. In 1930, they, um, they started increasing the number of home demonstration clubs here in Route County. And then we had the Elk Mountain, the Clark, the Slater, and the Mesa Club. Now, um, I got so excited about this that I went out to um, Casey's Pond on Tuesday and I had a wonderful video interview with Elaine Gay, who is now 96 years of age. She was a member of the Mesa Homemakers Club. Her mother was a founding member of that club. And let me just tell you, she's 96. They continue to get together and play cards. <laughs> um, and they, they play 500, um, sometimes at the Rabbit Ears Motel but they still get together. So at some point, many of these home demonstration clubs turned into, um, into canning, or it went from canning clubs to uh, social clubs. But the first, and this is kind of my main point, this is where they learn the skills, and they learn how to can. Um, the, in 1933, they had a meeting on budgeting food supply, canning, and drying. Um, canning, these lectures in 1933 introduced the pressure can. Um, and they did some water bath canning, but they really were trying to teach the frontier women about botulism because they were having a problem by um, having people canning meat in inappropriately. Now I should also tell you when I talked to Elaine Gay, she's 96, I said, did you use a pressure canner? And she said, oh, my mother would never let me use the pressure canner. Because it had to be done just right. And truly, when we teach canning classes, the pressure canner has to be done just right. And at that time, her mother was doing it over a coal stove. So managing a pressure canner over that, and we all have our, our stories about 
the, the early pressure canners and, you know, explosions and fears <laughs> and that kind of thing. And uh, so um, Elaine at 96 never pressure canned because her mother didn't want to <clears throat> allow her to do that. And I, I find that to be really hilarious. Um, but I, I found in 1933, and this is a little segue to Mary Kay, 1936 this report says, drying summer vegetables for winter use seems to have taken the country. <laughs> Many calls have come from women who have never taken part of extension activities, and drying has proved to be the easiest and surest method to use at altitude, as very few of the women have pressure cookers. Um, I also um, found reference to the fact that they did, at one point, um, uh, take, uh, in 1933, take a survey of all of the canned goods that were coming out, let me hang on for a minute, all of the canned goods that were coming out of the home demonstration clubs. And in 1933, 120 women reported canning 7,230 quarts of fruits and cherries, 1,241 quarts of jam, marmalade, and preserves, 2,076 quarts of jellies and spreads, and the list goes on. 3,000 quarts of vegetables. It's, it's a very lengthy list, and I will send that around. Um, so I'm, and, and when that, and you can just pass it around, it's a photocopy. I think some of you would find that very interesting. Some of the other, you know, they did cheese making workshops, that kind of thing. But I, I also have this great photo that they sent me and I, I'm gonna send around the names of the people in this photo. This is what I mean by a pretty gr grouchy bunch. I mean, these ladies just didn't look like they were having much fun. This was taken in 1930. My brother's this, this was the first meeting of the Homemakers Council. And in this picture should be the chairman, Mrs. Lufkin, the secretary, Mrs. Robinson, um, the uh, Mrs. Hitchens, Mrs. Bartholomew, Mrs. Hutspeth, Mrs. Uh, Woodcock, and Mrs. Becker, who turns out to be um, our, or our um, agriculture agent's um, great-grandmother. So I'm going to pass that around with the little list that kind of explains who's in the picture, but I actually have no idea who is, who is who. So that's the role, and we continue to have that role today. We um, still do canning classes and try to make sure that everybody's doing it right. As you all know, um, when you can at altitude, you have some very interesting um, adjustments that you need to make. So we uh, continue to work on that particular part of the education process at the Extension Office. So Nancy, I'll yeah. pass it on. Thanks, Karen, for sharing all your knowledge. We have Mary Kay Shaneman who's going to talk to us about more of the pre preserving foods that are, are dried, and so we'll let her take on. Is there something I can open? No. Okay. I'm all here. Thank you very much. My name is Mary Kay Shaneman. I've lived here for a really long time and have had the pleasure of knowing people like Elaine Gay, Helen Sherrod, a lot of the really old timers here. We, I could really relate to a lot of work that they did way back in the day, the food preservation, all that kind of stuff. But put that aside. Really, the oldest thing you, do, you did was dry foods. Way back in the day, they salted and dried everything. And the first dehydrator came about in France in 1795. So we've come a long ways from that day to now with our uh, dehydrating. There are various methods to use to dry products. You can use a solar dryer. I don't know, has anybody here ever seen one? It uses the sun's ray, monitors humidity and moisture. I know nothing about that. Um, you can dry produce in the oven. I've not had very good luck with it. My kale is like something the horses wouldn't eat. It's really dry and nasty. <laughs> so we're kind of fancier as my husband and I. This is one of his uh, projects, really. He does a lot of drying. We've dried everything under the sun. So we've dried a lot of fruits, vegetables, we've dried herbs, we've made beef jerky, and uh, we really have a lot of things in our, it's basically a cellar, it's a cool room that we added onto the house a few years ago, the year-round temperature is 50 degrees. So after you dry your produce or your fruits, 
we put them in French canning jars and just store them in the basement. And I brought quite a few items today. These are dried onions, which we dried last weekend. Um, we All he did was dip these in ascorbic acid, which you can get at the health food store or whatever, or you can use lemon juice. It just keeps them from turning brown over time. And they'll, their next stop will be French canning jars, and they'll stay for like a year or two or more. Onions. Uh, here's one of his failures, potatoes that we dried. <laughs> now the best thing to do with potatoes, if you're going to dry using a dehydrator, that is, bake them partially or bake them about two-thirds the way, then slice them thinly and put them in the dehydrator. And you will have potatoes to add to soups or stews for really a long while. Uh, carrots are really good and again this is stuff you know when you go to Costco and you buy 500 pounds of carrots and you can only use like one pound. Drying is a very good way if you don't choose to do a whole pressure canning and all that kind of stuff that <laughs> these guys do. 500 pounds we all of carrots. Do, but <laughs> drying is easier. Uh, fruits, you can dry fruits, they're wonderful and, and my husband originally started with the drying of fruits <coughs> because we wanted snacks to take out on the trail when we're hiking, skiing, whatever in the back country and we didn't like a lot of the chemicals that are in some of the things that are out there now. So if you're going to dry, for instance, peaches, wait till you get really top of the line peaches, let's say August kind of thing mm -hmm. and then you can dehydrate them they turn out beautifully and we have some now that we'll take out in the back country and just use for a snack. Very good, very good use of your dehydrator. Has anybody in here done any dehydrating, drying? Have you? What do you do? Everything? Pears, apples, and peaches are the main things that I do. Yep. Pineapple is very good too, but pineapple is a little bit finicky because it's really hard to get it completely dry. So with pineapple, you may want to eat it within the next two or three weeks. But um, we, we've really done a lot. You can do beef jerky. Beef jerky, again, you want to make sure you use very high quality meat without any marbling or gristle. Make sure that you use the appropriate marinades that are in a lot of the books or you can go on the internet and check it out. But beef jerky will take quite a bit of time too dry, like I think 20 hours kind of thing. And then we usually keep that in the refrigerator just to make sure that there isn't any moisture bacteria left behind because if things aren't completely dry, that's where you can get into problems. Yes? When you're making your beef jerky, do you want to put it in the oven to bring it up to temperature? Did not. We, um, we sliced it, he put it in a marinade for like 10 hours and then dried it. But as I said, it took really a long time. And we haven't done a lot of experimenting with it because we certainly just wanted a little for ourselves. I, there are pretty strict rules and regulations on Karen. She's the girl. You got to talk to the <laughs> extension office. They have lots of um, things that will be very helpful if you're wanting to do jerky. Right, and especially if you want to sell it as a food product to the public, there, you know, it's a very lengthy mm -hmm. process. But just for your own use, it it will work out well. Yes. What are French canning jars? Thank uh, you. They are the ones that have like the little metal thing on and the glass is they attached. Glass we might have one here. You can buy them all over, but it really seals things up very nicely. It's got like a plastic inner liner and, it, and there's no moisture. If you've dried properly, you should not see any moisture when you check it in like two weeks. If you see any moisture inside that jar, out the door it goes. Uh, the other thing you could do is do like a seal a meal type of thing after you're done dehydrating. But uh, back to dehydrators, you can buy a cheaper one, which is probably like $50, and that'll dry a lot of things very well. Um, you can do strawberries. Mm, strawberries are more or less like eating styrofoam after you've dried them for a while. <laughs> you can rehydrate them and maybe put them in some kind of a leather, like we made peach and strawberry leather over there. And that's from produce that's been in the freezer probably about six or eight months. And with uh, fruit leathers, any kind of fruit leathers, you don't really need top of the line fruit. You can use some of your damaged peaches. Whereas like for canning, freezing, some of those things, you want to make sure you've really got top quality fruit. Uh, dehydrators, as I was saying, you can buy a cheaper one for like $50 if you're just going to do this on a small 
uh, scale, or you can get the great big Excaliburs. I think they're like $600, or you can go way up into the thousands if you want to do drying and dehydrating commercially. And if you're the type of person who doesn't have any patience, dehydrating might not be for you because <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of a trial and error thing. And as I said, I've tried a lot of things in the um, oven. I never use the microwave. You can, do, you can do herbs, basil, rosemary, all that kind of stuff in a dehydrator. It doesn't take really long, but you don't want to keep an eye on it because if it gets... The problem with the oven is, in addition to the fact that it's not efficient, is things get really tough and brittle in there. So some kale I did a couple weeks ago in the oven, which was really nasty. I, um, and does everybody know how to do kale if they want to dry it? Use really good olive oil, I mean really good olive oil, and then sea salt or kosher salt, and then into the dehydrator. The stuff I did in the oven was nasty, so then I re kind of hydrated it with more olive oil and did it in the dehydrator and turned out beautifully. Yes? So what exactly does the dehydrator do that the oven, obviously the oven doesn't do? Well, it's going to dehydrate at a lower steady temperature for a longer period of time. The problem with ovens is you cannot keep that low temperature really very steady for a long time. And it's totally inefficient to use the oven, use all your gas or your electricity or whatever. The downside of the dehydrators, they're, they're noisy and they do put off a lot of heat into your kitchen. So what is the temperature about, do you know? For I, uh, I don't even know. Do you know, Linda? 160 degrees. Yeah, okay. I was going to say, yeah. it or less. runs from 140-ish yeah. kind of thing. Can I just add something? One of the reasons why a dehydrator works really well is that if you get the temperature too hot, it will make a case around the vegetable which prevents it from, from dehydrating. It kind of makes a little shell around it. Right. It's called case hardening. So what you want to be able to do is to keep the temperature really low. And depending on what you're dehydrating, there are different temperatures. Many ovens will not go that low. Actually, um, is where they start. But I will say that the extension office has an Excalibur um, uh, dehydrator that people borrow all the time. We loan it out. So if you need a canner or a dehydrator, come over to the extension office and we can set you up. I will also say, I was looking for this reference in here. In 1943, most of the fruits and vegetables were dried by using a screen suspended from the ceiling above the stove. Oh. So whatever you're doing, it's easier than they did in <laughs> Yes, exactly. The, probably the, one of the downsides of uh, dehydration is you are going to uh, lose some vitamin in the process, vitamins A and C. For vegetables, we usually blanch those just a tad, then the ascorbic acid, and then in the dehydrator. Fruits also with ascorbic acid or lemon juice because they will turn brown over time. But they really will turn out very nicely. I think uh, the only thing we had as a failure with fruits were grapes and they turned out really nasty. And raspberries because oh, of the seeds. Uh, yeah, we have not even tried raspberries. But we've done mushrooms, we've done green beans, and um, there's, a, there's a, a reference in this which I will pass around also. And this is from the uh, Colorado Agricultural College, which is a forerunner of CSU. And this, from the year 1918, Karen actually got this for me, but it talks about all of the dehydrating things that folks did over the years. But one of the things they said was to ensure that your corn and peas are really dry, get a hammer out and see if it smashes. Well, most of us probably don't have time to get the hammer out and see if they're really dry. But folks back in the day, when they dried things, they, they dried them outside or wherever in a place close to the stove maybe, which was emitting heat. And then <coughs> ran it through the grist mill, and I don't even know what a grist mill is, and then stored them in paper bags, glass jars, or whatever for later, later consumption. There are a lot of recipes in here, but one that particularly did not appeal to me was the cream of pea soup. And uh, I probably won't be making that. But I think the point of the whole thing is they really did a lot with drying and they used up every single thing they had. Yes? Um, in the early part of the century when they would dry things like peas and beans and corn, 
would they put them probably in stews or did they actually bring the corn out add it water says soups and then have and stew. corn? it says soup stews okay. things like that so and that's what we use them for these days okay. i i don't use them for really anything else but they it, in, in the day, if they wanted a, a, a pot of corn, they could bring it out and, and make the pot of corn out of the pot dehydration. Of yeah, all you have to do is hydrate it again and you're ready to go. So they just put it in boiling water or something right. like that? And, it and, would and they would do that instead corn of dessert. If they wanted just a, 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 a bowl of corn on the table, you know, to make it look colorful, then they, they just rehydrated it by putting it on the stove and boiling it. Right. Seasoning it and you're ready to go. So. Right. And dehydration, I took a class a number of years ago from a very interesting woman who came to visit us. She lived in rural somewhere or another. Walden. Walden, on a ranch, really in a very remote area, and she told us that she dehydrated everything. Leftover mashed potatoes, uh, yogurt, which I'm going to do for the class in June, leftover spaghetti sauce, just put it in the dehydrator, and then you've got like little crispy flakes that you can put in your soups or stews later on. And the dehydrated yogurt was very, very tasty. So at any rate, and uh, any other questions? This is so, the tip of the iceberg on drying. There's just Yeah, so drying is huge. And uh, as I said, my husband has kind of gotten into it and he's really the expert and I think he's going to help teach that class in June because he's done so much of this. But another uh, article I found the other day talked about candied flowers. Now this, you can take copies of this if you'd like. When, once we ever get flowers, which will be, what, July this year, <laughs> but dianthus, pansies, things like that, you can actually make sure they're nice and washed and then brush them with egg white and uh, very refined sugar, or just put regular sugar in the blender and coat them with that and you'll have decoration for cakes or cupcakes, whatever you want but it's just kind of an interesting thing. Uh, any other questions? This is the tip of the iceberg. The big class will be June 11th. A um, few of us are gonna teach that. And in the meantime, uh, dry like heck. Forget all this preservation. This Where, was time. <laughs> where will the class be held? At the extension office. At the extension office, yes. okay. The yeah. Which is where? It's behind the historic courthouse in the annex on 6th on and Oak. Right across from the old mortuary. <laughs> I don't know where it's at. Just over the way. Right behind the courthouse. Behind the courthouse. So be sure and try the fruit leather here. It has no added anything. It's just straight fruit that was in the freezer, cooked down a little bit in a double boiler, and then spread out on the pans and put in the dehydrator. And I think it was about four hours before we had the fruit leather. Okay, thank you. I'm Linda Long. I'm a fourth generation Rock Countyan and uh, from a pioneer family. And we canned, we dehydrated, we smoked, we did everything that the pioneers did because that was our survival. That was the way we had to live. And so I keep telling all these girls when we've done the master food canning class, mine is a whole lot different than, than picking up you know a pretty jar and saying wow I made that you know and, and things ours is out of survival we we did it because we had to have it and, and have it on the shelf and I, my lifestyle hasn't changed I still can a lot I still preserve a lot I still dehydrate I still do all those things because that's just been my way of life so it's been a, been an easy um, transition to work with these girls and, and I, I really have enjoyed it. And she can make rhubarb cobbler with one arm. So yeah. she, she's amazing. She's just amazing. <laughs> Helping my husband. He had to put it in the oven and get it out for me. But anyway, um, I brought in old canning books and the reason is because I do a lot of judging in the counties around our area here and the first thing that we've done, especially when we've changed our times, is basically what we've done is they've added about 15 minutes to our altitude here which has always been pretty much that way but they've added another 15 minutes just for safety of, of our foods that we're preserving the foods that we get in today is a whole lot different than what grandma used to have and these old books i've got some in here from 1938 37 uh, you're welcome to look through them this is a 1937 book it was grandma's book um, it has, I have a collection of them, 
and I've got the new books to compare with them. And Grandma's book recipes are absolutely just fine. But the difference that we have today from what Grandma used to do is our produce is different. If we are taking 90 days on Grandma's book to produce a tomato, and we can do it now in 55 days, we are losing something in that. And that's the natural preservatives that we have have gathered in the, in the fruits and the vegetables that we're doing. The same thing with the apples. They've got all these hundred new apples on the markets today. It's different from what grandma used to can. So what we want to do as a food preservationist is to really make sure that you guys understand grandma's recipes are just fine. It's the produce that you're going to use that's not so fine. It doesn't have the natural preservatives that grandma used to have. So if you find an old recipe, the best thing that you can do is take it to Karen's office and they will make sure that it is up to date and is safe to use in today's time. And again, you know, it's not 100% that everything is not good, that what Grandma had is what different is what today, but you also know in common sense thinking that if it takes 90 days for Grandma, 55 days for me, there's something that's going to be missing in there, and that's the natural preservatives. So those are the things that we really wanted to put across to it. Uh, we brought in some old equipment that they used to use. Uh, I've got some, I mean, this is the tip of my iceberg here. I, I've brought in several different canning uh, jar lifters, you know, different things like that that, that uh, you know, you guys are welcome to look through. Um, we have several canning classes set up for this summer and it's all through the accounting uh, extension office. So if anybody is wanting to use any of the equipment or learn how to use the equipment, we're here to teach you. And what we'd like to, you know, I mean, I I have been canning with the pressure canner since I was this high, so so I don't understand the fear of the pressure canner and, and because we did it at home all the time. And so we have a boiling water bath, we have the pressure canner, we have the dehydration, and all of, the, all of those things are the natural preservatives of what we have to do here to keep our food alive. You know, I mean, nobody thinks about going to the grocery store, but as a child, we never had fresh fruits after Thanksgiving. We never had fresh vegetables again after Thanksgiving until usually about July, we would get some fresh vegetables in or something like that, and it was always exciting, you know. We never got corn till October, <laughs> you know, and now we can buy it all year round, you know. So, so our generation now is very, very lucky in that we have all of this stuff that we can just go to the grocery store and pick it up. <coughs> but um, it, there's something about being able to preserve it yourself too and to be able to use it and to be able to share it with your families and your friends. So um, if there's any questions, we're here to answer them and we appreciate you guys coming today. So you said that, you know, that you've got less, we have less preservatives in our fruits and vegetables now than we used to. So to compensate for that, you're saying that we need to uh, put it like in the pressure cooker or the boiling bath longer. Is that what you're yes. saying? Except that your pressure canner is more pounds, not more time. So if it's, if, it, if the pressure canner is saying 10 pounds in the pressure on the pressure can on your on yeah. this piece here yeah. in in our altitude you're going to make it 15 pounds oh, to make it safe in the water bath you're going to instead of doing say 45 minutes then you add another 15 minutes to that 45 minutes to make it safe for our altitude may i clarify one thing when she talks about natural preservatives um the the thing the pathogens that will cause foodborne illness do not like acid and the tomatoes that we grow really quickly never develop the acid and that's what is you know, the natural protecting. preservative yeah so so we have to do things differently these early books um, they did not have you adding lemon juice to your canned tomatoes we do now um, you could water bath tomatoes here well, unless you add lemon juice, you have to pressure can tomatoes because there's not enough acidity. So, um, so that that's kind of a clarity of, of what she means by natural preservatives. It has a lot to do with the acidity of of the uh, vegetable. Okay, even if it's sealed, 
Yeah. Well, the, the what we're talking about is before it gets sealed, because you're going to seal in something. Right. And if it is a low acid food, then it has to be pressure canned. And what is a low acid food? Any kind of vegetable, Cheers. pretty much. Low acid foods are meat. Back in the day, they used to can a lot of fish. Um, Linda can remember, what were the fish you used to get here? Are they gildings or what were they? We, so, the salmon so, over in over by Kremlin, we would go get salmon, but you can get the white fish and they're almost like a salmon. We do trout. They do. would, but they would gather those here and then <clears throat> they'd can them. And those are very low acid, you'd have to pressure can them. What has a lot of acid? Apples and most fruits, like peaches and apricots and cherries, do not have to be pressure canned. But vegetables and meats and anything that has dairy, has to be pressure canned. And in the back in the day they used to you would take a jar of jam and they were not they were not canned in terms of, they were just basically they put the hot jam in the jar and put paraffin on top and that's not the method at all anymore it's not safe. And these those are some of the things that the bible of of canning the ball blue book has gone from that era to this era where they give you adjustments for altitude and new and different ways to make jam and jelly safe. Those are the things that, that we're talking about here because you can put hot jam in a jar and turn it upside down and it will seal. But is it safe? It's not a, it's not a recommended way to make a, a jar of food In order safe. for that jar of jam to be safe, you need to process it for 15 minutes. The, the, early, minutes at our altitude. the early methods of canning use something called the open kettle method. <laughs> um, and basically they would put boiling contents into a jar and then put a lid on it. What is different now when we do water bath canning or pressure canning is that you take that jar and you leave enough room so all the air can escape and then you put it under pressure or you put it uh, for an extended period of time at our altitude or you do a water bath and what you're doing is getting the internal temperature hot enough to kill whatever pathogens are in there. So you, if you do have a ball blue book at home it should be at least 1990 or <laughs> earlier or later. If it's a historic document, just because it's a ball blue book does not mean it's accurate anymore. But it's nice to keep. I still have a block of paraffin, and I'm hoping that method will come back. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make candles at Jackie's house. <laughs> Jackie's <laughs> after your lifetime. <laughs> so does anybody have any questions? Uh, one quick question. What is the biggest change that you've seen in your personal canning? I know you talked about the, the fruits and vegetables, but from the time you were a little girl to Probably now. the produce. You mm -hmm. know, it doesn't keep as well as our old time pieces did. Um, and, and now that I've learned the newer methods, you know, and, and have updated my, my way of doing things, it, you know, I'm successful with it, you know, but it used to be that there was a lot of spoilage mm -hmm. because we didn't have the same product, you know. So, so those things are different. Uh, we didn't have deep freezes mm -hmm. back uh, when I was young, and so we didn't have the opportunity to freeze anything to, to keep it. Uh, I was taught when I did, uh, took my first dehydrations, that my mom and my grandmother and all my aunts didn't teach me was that if you want to really keep it for a long time, just when you get it back like this, just drop it in deep freeze and it'll be there for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. So uh, those were ways that we could, you know, keep preserving it, you know, and things. But uh, the dehydrations was, we, you know, I, I guess you just kind of do it without a second thought, you know. That was the way that when we did meats, we just did it, you know. So, and the vegetables too. So. What's your favorite local stuff, the things that you grow in your garden to, to preserve? Um, green beans, of course, peas. Uh, just, I, I don't do the, I, I, the first time that I did spinach on my <coughs> own, I brought in three bags of spinach that was in the garbage bag that was about this tall. And I worked very hard trying to get the spinach in the jars and when I got them all done I had 12 jars. <laughs> so I don't do spinach anymore <laughs> because it just for the time that it takes um, and, the, and the amount you get out of it it's like boy I could use that a whole lot better in a different way. I say that about pumpkin. 
Pumpkin is another one, you know, and, and they really <laughs> waste the time. <laughs> they what they do too on they've changed the pumpkins a lot for food safety because of the compaction that they have in the jar. They don't want you to mash it like we used to do in my grandmother's day and you keep it in a cube because mm -hmm. you don't want it to get too compacted in the jar so that inner temperature will get to the correct temperature that it has. So those are the things that you'll learn in the newer newer canon books. And that, you know, and like I said, you know, the things that we have to really be careful is, is to, to let people know that grandma's recipe isn't really good. It, grandma's recipe is just fine. It's just the difference in the products that we're using to, to make grandma's recipe fine. Mm -hmm. So take that recipe, take it to the extension office, and they'll help you get We'll it. help you update it so that it's that safe it to fine, you. <laughs> you know, because there's something about the tradition of, of Having you know, and and I'm I'm a everybody knows as a witness I'm I'm one of them that uh, it, it's very special to be able to hand on the family traditions down to the family. So so it's very you know for for you to say you know, I can't use grandma's recipes you can you just have to update everything. With them, so. Okay. Food over here. We, what we've done is we've brought in different different things that we've got out of the cookbook. Uh, I brought rhubarb cobbler, which is frozen, but I brought rhubarb cobbler because I could do it with one hand. <laughs> so, so uh, we've got some demonstrations of some canning that we've got in here too, and things. So anyway, just look around and and talk to any of us. We're we're here to answer the questions. Yay! So as I had said, we came together to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Brown County Fair and we put this cookbook together. So as a committee and as, um, as we spent three years gathering recipes and that kind of thing, we um, really felt like the historical piece was fun. So in the back of the cookbook, we had this section called This and That. Um, and in the This and That um, sec section, um, one of the things that just really hit home for me, who, you know, I'm kind of a younger generation canner, but I grew up in a family of canners and my ki my kids, you know, have a grandma that would send them, you know, um, fruit cocktail in a jar and those kind of things. Um, but I, what I found was a, a whole new respect for the generation of women who lived here in Mount County and, and kept their families well fed in this kind of a place where we don't have fresh things and after, you know, after Thanksgiving, that kind of thing. So in this section, um, there are a few really fun um, recipes that I came um, across and just was really um, enamored with. And one of them that Karen and I talk about is called water glass for eggs. So uh, chickens, they don't always lay, they gotta have those longer days. So what were, the, what were these women doing to be able to bake something in the off season or to be able to have eggs in some of this variety of food? Um, there's water glass for eggs and it was actually something that you could go to, what was the store in Oak Creek? Museum. Well, what, what was the the store in Oak Creek? They actually yeah. sold bells in in Oak Creek would sell water glass for eggs, and you could immerse your eggs in that, and they would keep, and you would be able to have a fresh-ish kind of an egg in the off season. Um, I, I just kind of I, wow. I, I just was amazed by that. Then I also felt like okay, so all of us really take for granted the fact that um, that I can go to work forty hours a week. It, it's just fine. But back in the day, our grandmothers they they didn't have time to go to work forty hours a week. This was their job to be able to feed their families. In, in the winter, they had to spend every waking hour in the summer making sure that there was something food-wise for them to eat. And so not only were they able to, to bring nutrition to their families, but oh my gosh, they did some beautiful things with it. I mean, if this is not art, I do not know what is. If this <laughs> jar of peaches is not beautiful, there we have it. I'm just going to pass that around. There, um, and then tomatoes, things that they, they did. This piece of technology was not just beautiful, but it was something that kept everyone nutritiously, um, you know, thriving here in Route County. So, um, you know, there's, there are those kind of things that are just single ingredient kind of things. And then there are things that we make now, which we're kind of Gucci canners now. We want to do something to give to all of my husband's um, co-workers or whatever. So we do things like brandy blackberries. Well, you know, that's not something that anyone who was just <laughs> feeding their families might have done, but it might have been a treat for them. Um, pickled beets, now that was something that was very utilitarian. And growing beets here is really kind of cool. That's something that we could do, these root crops. So pickled beets, that was something pretty, uh, pretty functional. Um, you know, uh, peach salsa? Well, I make peach salsa now because I can go to Grand Junction and get peaches, but they weren't making peach salsa. 
and salsa wasn't even, I mean, it's a newish kind of a thing. Um, and then things like, um, well, I make my own pizza sauce because I think it's kind of, I made it because it was a fun gift for my kids at Christmas time and I know they eat pizza so they might use pizza sauce. Um, or my mother-in-law makes um, corn relish and all my friends are like, what do you use corn relish for? And <laughs> I'm like, oh, by the way, there's a recipe in the cookbook where I use my corn relish. <laughs> so there's some of those kind of things that we do. Um, we just wanted to make sure that um, that we had a good representation of the things that um, that people are um, making now, um, but also things that like canning peaches and canning tomatoes. You know, I have people who ask me, what, what do you do with your chili? Well, I put home canned tomatoes in it. That's my only secret. Anything else is not there. So um, as canners, we're passionate about that. We are passionate about the history of it, and we really do have respect for the fact that these people put up food that, so that their families could be fed all the way through. Um, and again, this last chapter of the book is really fun in terms of um, finding um, we, we pulled all sorts of things from the, the museums around the county, and some of them were like lists of daily chores, what's to be done daily before breakfast. Front porch to be swept, to be scrubbed every Wednesday and Saturday, except in freezing weather. Porch chairs to be kept free from dust. Dining room, living room, and reception hall to be dusted. Sweeper run over rugs each day if necessary before breakfast, okay? So, <laughs> again, I guess what, what we're just saying is that the people, these kind of um, skills and, and gains in technology were really something that we respect those women for, and I totally understand why um, why this was a job. This was their, you know, their life's work, and they were very um, successful at it. The other thing that I wanted to note, and I don't know what I did with it, um, there's a, a, a recipe for lye soap in there. It's Some in of the these, kitchen. is it in the kitchen? You want to get it? Um, Jackie Grimaldi, her mom made um, lye soap back in the day, and it's really difficult to find the ingredients for that lye soap now. But you Helen, can't buy lye. You can't buy lye any longer because it's not safe. No. But so Helen Sherrod made this in her lifetime, and we still have some of it. It's pretty amazing how I you still know, use it. She, I keep it by my um, in my laundry room sink and for stains. This morning I washed my hands with it, and it's really soft on the hands because of all the lard that's in it, yeah. even though there is lye in it. So here's some lye soap that had been made. You guys can take a look at that. Um, Why is it lye, lye safe? What's I don't know, but you can't, most people are, up until the last few years, you have to have it for making soap, but uh, you just can't buy it anymore. And I think they also use it for making meth and some of the other yeah. So there's some of those issues with it. So it didn't work for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't know if we have any closing. Anybody get wants that soap? Because I have a. She has lots of it. She About says. fifty bars. We could do. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we will say that um, the the hundredth anniversary cookbook is for sale here at the um, at the museum. If you buy it today, then we also have the history of the fair book that we'll throw in for you. So if you want to buy one of these from the museum, we'll have a few of these copies that we'll give to you if you want to buy one of those. If you have questions, we have a wealth of knowledge in some of these women here that have been doing this for generations and have learned from their uh, predecessors. So it's pretty exciting if there are any other questions or if you just want a private conversation with us. <laughs> I, have a, I have a question from this. Yeah, okay, Mary Kay. Here's a recipe for potato scrapple. And it calls for emmer, E-M-M-E-R. What is emmer? Thank Real. you for bringing that up. I meant to look that up because I don't know what it is either. And I, do you know, is it like a tripe or something? Yeah, we're going to have to Google it. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to Google it. It's old wheat. Simply, it's an old wheat. Oh, it's a type of wheat. It's old wheat. Okay. Interesting. I meant to look that up. Interesting. Well, we want to make sure that there's time for everyone to, sa to sample as well. Do you have a question? Yeah, between freezing, drying, and canning, what do you lose the most nutrients doing? Canning. Dehydration. Yeah. <laughs> really? What second? You lose the most nutrients with dehydration. What second? Um, well, best is fresh, then frozen, then canned, then dehydrated. So the other thing to remember too is that even just because you put it in the freezer doesn't mean that it just stands still there. I mean, it's still decaying at some level. So even putting it in the freezer, you just want to keep using it. 
there's a the saying that you should if anything you can you should use within a year so there's still so I mean you know just because you preserve it doesn't mean it's good forever you should use it enjoy it yes and I have a whole list in my office that will tell you depending on what it is how long it should stay in the freezer but we make our own and garlic powder, onion powder, and that stuff will really last in a tightly sealed jar for really a long time. But if you make your own garlic powder, and that's after you dehydrate your garlic and then pulverize it in the blender, uh, it'll knock your socks off. So don't use the normal amount because it is really strong. Onion powders and garlic powders that we've made using produce from our garden. Did it? Great.